Joining me now to discuss the BTC price and other Bitcoin news is our Week in Review panel. We've got Coindesk Managing Editor of Technology, Christy Hark in Toronto, and Coindesk Research Analyst, George Kaloudis in New York. Hello there, George and Christy. Hello. Hey, Christine. All right. So let's start off with the markets as we like to do. The week had a rough start with the great British pound crashing after the Bank of England raised interest rates and the new government unveiled plans for sweeping tax cuts and higher borrowing. And the plummeting pound had the Bank of England intervening by Wednesday, buying bonds to restore orderly market conditions. And George, I find it fascinating that Bitcoin was less volatile than the British pound and other developed currencies around the world. Yeah. It's definitely absolutely fascinating. And thankfully, the pound did end up recovering. But the volatility that it experienced during the week, not just from a USD GB, GBP perspective, but also from the 10 year gilt, the British equivalent of treasuries, was something straight out of an altcoin casino, right? I'd expect something like that from Shiba Inu coin or Dogecoin. Actually, I'd, I'd probably still expect it from something like Bitcoin. Low risk treasury bonds shouldn't be doing this. These sovereign currencies that have been around for centuries shouldn't be doing this during the week. So it's a bit fascinating, but also a little bit scary, right? Hopefully our bond markets start acting more even keeled before central banks start talking about yield curve control. You talked about uh, something Arthur Hayes said earlier. Arthur Hayes is King Arthur, the yield curve control uh, king, I guess, saying that it's coming. Uh, if we look at the yen in Japan, it doesn't feel like yield curve control is something we want to go after in any central bank. So hopefully that's not where we have to end up going. What are we seeing here, George? Seeing all that the is crises, uh... something that comes from my newsletter, which you guys should totally read. It comes out on Sundays, crypto long and short. <laughs> this is the dollar milkshake theory, which says something along the lines of all fiat currencies will tend to zero over time. But... One of them will tend to zero slower. And because the US dollar is the base of all you know, financial debt and it's the world reserve currency, it's gonna go down slower and all the value will go from the milkshake of all the other currencies to the milkshake that is the US dollar. So we love talking about short squeezes in crypto. The US dollar is gonna be short squeezed. Now it's just a theory. Who knows if it happens, it's going to happen. But the past year, it seemed like the U.S. dollar is performing way stronger than all other sovereign currencies. Interesting to see that chart with the fiat currencies uh, diverging that way. All right. That's what right. about Bitcoin? Uh, what, what's We've seen Bitcoin within this $18,000 to $20,000 trading range in recent weeks. Um, where, where do you see Bitcoin headed? Yeah, Bitcoin is fighting for its life. It's tried not to end, you know, this quarter down again. We've had two straight quarters of negative performance. If we end up this quarter going down, it's going to be a sad, sad day for the bulls. You know, you said this 18K to 20K range. I swear, every time I refresh the CoinDesk uh, homepage, it's it says 20,000 and then it refreshes down to 18. So this this range, the psychological level of 20,000, I would love to see it above that. Um, it's been an emotional roller coaster. It seems like the market was yeah. waiting with bated breath to figure out what to do as US, infl U.S. inflation data comes in. We saw Eurozone inflation is really high. Netherlands was really high at 17%. And then the U.S. core PC came in above expectations. But there was this weird thing where people were still spending more money than expected. So Bitcoin went up. I don't know. Uh, I'm hoping October is going to be a better month. I wrote last month, wake me up when September ends. So September's last day is today. So... Let's, well, let's you know who thinks uh, Bitcoin's going to go up? Do you know who Bit who thinks Bitcoin's going to go up? It's going to it's uh, CFTC Chairman Rostin Benno. He's uh, <laughs> quite the Bitcoin bull, and it's not every you know uh, administration that a U.S. regular weighs in on the price of Bitcoin. Yeah. Um... I feel like he must have said not financial advice before he said Bitcoin might double in price if there was a CFTC regulated market. It's kind of interesting seeing these two political uh, NGOs, GOs, whatever they are, fight over who's going to regulate crypto, regulate Bitcoin. And the CFTC has a really good case. The SEC has a worse case. And this like this power struggle of the CFTC here is saying, hey, we're going to totally do it. And if we do, 
trust us, Bitcoin bulls are going to the moon. That is more bullish than I think I am right now. So uh, <laughs> go ahead. Yep. If you think if you can get double the price, be my yeah. guest. <laughs> All right. Let's shift over to Bitcoin adoption. So, you know, it's been one year since El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. And we had a strike CEO, Jack Maulers, who was side by side with uh, El Salvador President Nayib Bukele when the first announcement was made that this would happen, that Bitcoin would become legal, a legal tender in El Salvador. And so he was on Coindesk this week and, you know, he had some thoughts on, well, we asked him about what he thought about this law one year later. And he said, well, it doesn't hurt my company at all. And I guess he said that in the context that, you know, we, we see that the, uh, the Bitcoin adoption has not worked so well in terms of uh, the president saying that he's buying the dip, he's buying up Bitcoin, putting on, uh, using taxpayer money and putting that on the, the country's balance sheet. And, and since then, it has lost a uh, significant value. And well, at least in Mahler's case, it hasn't hurt his company. They're not a consultant. So I... Um, Christy, you have some thoughts on this. Well, uh, I have a couple of thoughts, and, and really it's more of a bigger picture thing. First of all, we are looking at what year one uh, in the middle of a bear market, and we're trying to evaluate whether or not El Salvador is, is winning in this case. And this is probably not the time frame we should be thinking about. Um, as one, uh, as Ian Gaines, the communication director of the Bitcoin Policy Institute noted, any sovereign nation that disrupts at a level as foundational as its monetary system will not do so without encountering unforeseen complications, initial gridlocks, and the need for an adjustment period. Throw a bear market in on that, and oh my, that's a recipe for disappointment. We're also looking at a situation where the implementation, the use case for Bitcoin was generated in a sort of top-down way. Yes, there was Bitcoin Beach. There was, you know, there was a, a kind of community that was sort of already starting, but it was very much a top-down impl Im Im sort of implementation of Bitcoin, as opposed to it being super grassroots. And the, to contrast that, there was another report that came out this week from Chainalysis, which was reported on by uh, our reporter Frederick Manala. And it shows that there's super strong crypto usage and adoption rates in many African countries. And this is from a bottom up level. In fact, it is going against what their governments would prefer them to do in many cases. This is especially true, excuse me, in Nigeria and Kenya. So one of the things that this analysis points out, and this is really important for a lot of us in the Western world to keep in mind, is that there is a difference in use cases between countries um, like Nigeria and Kenya and other African countries and El Salvador. Um, we can contrast that with affluent Western countries that use crypto to increase wealth with poor African, African countries that use crypto to preserve and build wealth amid unfavorable economic conditions. Um, there is not the same level of institutional trading going on in, say, sub-Saharan Africa. The market that drives crypto there is retail and a lot of that crypto is actually bitcoin so you're looking at people who let's say are highly educated with uh, young uh, graduates with not great uh, job prospects and they're looking for a way of building wealth or just staying above water and that's what crypto is giving them in spite of a lot of political upheaval or monetary upheaval that they're finding is going on wherever they're living and one of the yeah. uh, companies, for example, there is Paxful. They are seeing, uh, even in a bear market, they are experiencing growth, user growth, 55% growth in Nigeria and 140% in Kenya. So it all depends on what you're needing Bitcoin for, what you're using it for and where you are. Um, and I think that that is something that people would do well to understand when they're thinking about Bitcoin use cases and adoption. 
Absolutely. That, that's a great contrast, uh, showing how the top-down approach versus the bottom-up approach works in terms of actually getting retail users to use Bitcoin for payments. And I believe the chain analysis report said that Sub-Saharan Africa has the world's highest proportion of crypto retail payments of less than $1,000. That's about 80%, so pretty significant there.